Let's pray together a prayer for illumination. O oh Lord, our Father, here we are. We're here for you. We want to hear you. We just pray that you would be with Tony Charles today as he gives us your word. We pray that you would fill him with your spirit. And Lord, we ask that you would make our hearts ready to receive what he has to say to us. We pray, Lord, that you would open us up, that you would relieve us of any distractions or burdens, aches and pains, things weighing on us. And we pray, Lord, that you would make us ready to receive whatever you would give us today. We thank you so much for your word, for your constancy in our lives, and for your message that you're going to give us today through Tony, your servant. Amen. The scripture reading today is from Matthew, um, chapter 4, verses 23 to 5, 2, and then Matthew 6, 9, and 10, and then from Mark 12, 37, B. And he, Jesus, went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. So his fame spread throughout all Syria, and they brought him all the sick, those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed by demons, epileptics, and paralytics, and he healed them. And great crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis, and from Jerusalem and Judea, and from beyond the Jordan. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth, and he taught them, saying, Pray then like this, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And the common people heard him gladly. This is the word of the Lord. Praise be to Christ. Would you pray with me? O oh, Abba, Father God, we pray with tender hearts and common grace that you would give our softened hearts a hunger and a longing for your kingdom to really come. Not just to us individually, but let your kingdom come to our communities our nation, and our world. We pray you would make us willing to do your will and surrender our wills to your own with the cheerfulness and the zeal that the angels have as in heaven, so here on earth. Amen. It's been a while and I'm back. I am honored that our pastor Matt asked me to preach this Sunday while he's away on study leave. Some of you may not know that I was ordained a minister of the Word and Sacrament in the PCUSA, right up there in the hayloft, wherever it is, almost 31 years ago. It's been a journey to get here, but I am now in the process of transferring membership to the EPC, Evangelical Presbyterian Church, so I may better serve the kingdom from where I feel called to be, and that's right here. Pastor Matt assigned me to preach on the portion of the Lord's Prayer that the Westminster Larger Catechism refers to as the second and third requests. The verse is, thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Pastor Matt preached on the first request, hallowed be thy name, last Sunday. And if you missed it, you can watch it online for free by downloading the sermon, by downloading sermon.net. It's an app. You can get it on your smartphone or you can watch it on your smart TV. So let's dig right in, shall we? First of all, let me ask a why question. My mother told me that she knew 
From the time I was a child that I was destined to be a preacher because I was always asking her why about everything, but especially about the Bible. I have a little grandnephew, Ruger Charles, out in Wyoming, nine years old, who is a lot like me and asks why about every 30 seconds, according to his mother. So why don't we pray the words of the Lord's Prayer? Of course, we pray it in church. We just did once, once every Sunday and uh, most Sundays and, and then in communion. But um, I'm talking about at home and in your car and driving to and from work and in the shower and, yes, even in the bathroom before you go to bed and when you wake up in the morning, not just at church. What hinders us from using the simple formula laid out so plain and concise by Jesus himself as he laid it out for his disciples, not just the 12, but the wider circle of followers, and yes, the great crowds that heard it on that day in the Sermon on the Mount, in the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus delivered what has been called the greatest sermon ever preached. Some scholars think that there were up to 10,000 or more gathered around that mountain in Galilee. Don't ask me how, but by some miracle of nature or the projection of Jesus' voice from the top of that mountain, Jesus got his message across with no PA and no surround sound speakers. Jesus is described five times in the New Testament as having a loud voice. And if the acoustics were right on a clear day and the crowds were spellbound, hanging on his every word, he could easily have spoken to 20,000. Archaeologist Kobe Chrysler and professional sound engineer Mark Miles tested this very theory in the exact spots on the Sea of Galilee and got it precisely the same results. You can look up their article in the Biblical Archaeologist Journal, The Acoustics and Crowd Capacity of Natural Theaters in Palestine. Jesus knew right where to be. Fast forward to now, research surveys have discovered that few Christians today actually pray the Lord's Prayer at home or privately in their devotionals. For some, like I said, the only time they pray it is in church, before the sermon or during communion. So why don't we? The Pew Research Center says that only 42% of Christians worldwide even pray once a day. Then when asked why in surveys, Christians have said things like, I'm just too busy running around, going to work, taking my kids to school, going to meetings and soccer games and to, to stop and take the time to pray. How long does it take to pray the Lord's Prayer? Have you ever timed it? How long do you think? Anybody? It takes me, of course, I'm Southern, so I speak very slowly, but it takes me, it takes me 23 seconds. And I, I asked Siri to pray the Lord's Prayer. It took her 30 seconds, but she really speaks slowly. So, yes, we still have trouble squeezing the time into our day. I agree with a research professor and ex-pastor at Baylor University, Phil Van, Phil Van Auken, who wrote an article recently on this very topic, Why We Don't Pray. And he said... Most Christians feel guilty when the subject of prayer is brought up. We all believe in the power of prayer and in the importance of prayer, but we just don't seem to do it enough. Our churches are suffering 
from prayer anemia and spiritual malnutrition because of lack of prayer. Let's be honest about it. We don't pray enough because we don't want to. (laughs) We don't want to enough. And there's some reasons, and I identify with these, and maybe you will too. Number one, he said, we don't want anything. Too many of us lead satisfied, complacent lives other than an occasional problem or two that crop up. Things go pretty well in our comfortable lives and at home. Why pray a lot when we've basically got everything we want? The truth is, we don't want anything more because our desires are too small. The spiritual blessings Father God offers us are so rich and sweet. Remember what he offers? As Pastor Matt says many times, in quoting Romans 14, 7, for the kingdom of God, that's what we're talking about, is all righteousness and life and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. We need only ask and seek and knock, praying thy kingdom come. The second reason that we don't pray is we don't care enough about others. We don't really care. I know we care, but do we really care? We say good morning and have a nice day to people at work and at church. We pass on the street. Well, if you're from the South, you say it to people on the street. A lot of people up here don't. Um, And we commiserate with our neighbor and the yard about the weather. But that's about as far as it goes. We don't care enough about others to go beyond our bland superficiality so we don't pray for them much. And okay, I get it. Some of us suffer from compassion fatigue. But what if the next time we bump into our neighbors talking across the fence and We say a quick prayer for them as we walk back to the house. Just something simple like, Lord, bless my neighbor. Number three, the third reason is we think small. Our world revolves around us, around our daily routine, live streaming television, minor aches and pains, visits to the doctor, to restaurants, to the mall. Not too much to pray about there. But what if we widen the perimeter just a bit and we just go ahead and practice praying for our local leaders, our people in government, regional and national, What if things started changing, not just in them, but in you and me? Number four, the fourth reason we don't pray is we don't want to get involved. We pay the pastor to run the church, the missionaries to evangelize, and the government to care for the poor, and they've got things well in hand, right? They're doing a great job, so why pray? I know, because we're tired. We've maxed out our bandwidth. We're overcommitted. We just don't have the energy to add one more thing to our plate. But would it kill us to pray for God to send someone else to help him lighten the load like Jesus said, pray the Lord of harvest that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. No, I'm not going to pray that. He might send me. We're afraid God will respond. Number five, if we do pray about something and God happens to respond, then we're really on the spot, aren't we? What if God wants to use us personally in answering that prayer? 
our comfortable lives might be interrupted. And yes, when it happens, and it does happen, is there anything more wonderful than knowing that we are in sync with the Spirit of God? That we are being utilized by the Lord for His purposes? Rich and sweet. Well, which one of these reasons hits home and lands the hardest for you? I don't mean to browbeat anybody into praying or laying a guilt trip on you. That approach never works. But I'm right there with you. And I'm asking, why don't I? Maybe you have your own reasons that don't fit neatly into one of these five categories. Or maybe you don't know. You just haven't thought about it much. Your mind is on other things. But whatever the reasons we may think we have for not praying, we need to remind ourselves that we need to pray it even when we don't want to or feel like it. I'm going to take a risk and get real honest here now. One reason I don't pray often enough, especially the Lord's Prayer, it's not a stroke of genius, but a streak of hubris. It's too simple. That's for kids. My self-identity is wrapped around an old delusion that tells me I'm fiercely independent, autonomous, self-sufficient. It says stubbornly, don't worry, I got this. You hear that a lot, don't you, today? Don't worry, I got this. I got this. Let me tell you right now, I don't got this. I don't got this, and neither do you. I'll say more. I didn't come from the lineage of one of those 12 tribes of Israel. No, my pedigree spawns from the Scots, Irish, English, Scandinavian, Native American, God knows what all for sure, mix of Appalachian hillbillies in North Georgia. My father and mother were dirt poor sharecroppers, like their moonshine making parents before them. My mother had a seventh grade education, and by gum, she determined her young'uns were going to make something of themselves and go to college. So I did, and worked extra hard to put myself through school pull myself up by the bootstraps and earn high honors in college and seminary. But it wasn't until I hit my midlife crisis and had my IQ tested that I found out just how really smart I was. The scores showed that I was slightly above average for the average minister in the United States but slightly below average for the average Presbyterian minister in the United States. So add the two together and divide by two, and what do you get? Average. Oh, my God. Average intelligence? After all that work, how insultingly disgusting. There must have been some mistake. No mistake. Average. Just common. How I hated that word. It reminds me of a joke I heard from a spry little old Jewish woman on Starkell Road near Bishop's Corner Senior Center when my small group Bible study sang there once or twice. Her joke went like this. Mr. and Mrs. Potato Head were appalled to learn their young daughter, they called Potato Bug, 
had fallen for a sportscaster who wanted to marry her. Never, said Mr. Potato Head. I won't have any daughter of mine marrying a commentator. <laughs> After laughing my head off, that little spry Jewish woman grabbed my tie and pulled me down next to her so she could whisper in my ear. And she said, I'll let you in on a little secret. We're all commentators. And we are. We're all commentators. And commentators need Jesus every single hour of every day just to get by. Like the crowds of commoners who gathered from every direction around Galilee, there were Jews mixed with Gentiles, Greeks, Syrophoenicians, and God knows what else from the ten cities of Decapolis who came out to hear that greatest sermon ever preached and hear the Lord's Prayer. Yes. Did you know that Jesus pulled well-known phrases from commonly known and prayed Jewish prayers of the day and still to, in this day, like the Kaddish and the Amida. No, Jesus didn't create a brand new prayer that would be hard to learn and recall. He used simple phrases that even the children could learn and remember. There were lots of children there that day. And why? Because like it or not, we are all God's children. We're all God's children. We need to be praying the same way, saying the same things, regardless of how young or old or how smart we think we are. The great crowds term Am Haaretz. I hope you're getting some of these up there. There it is. Yeah. The term Am Haaretz in Hebrew, that term didn't just mean people of the land. It came to be used in a pejorative way as a slur against the commoners. It also meant mongrels, mixed breeds, half-bloods, no-goods, unclean, unwashed, undignified, many definitions. But Jesus, you know what? He loved the crowds of commoners. And they loved him. The common people heard him gladly. Now, I could end this prayer right there, but I'm not going to. Here's what we need to know about the second request to the Lord's Prayer, Thy Kingdom Come. Now, you can Google Westminster Larger, you can Google Westminster Larger Catechism in modern English and find it free on the Internet. You don't need to buy it. The Larger Catechism. I'll be glad to send you a link if you don't know where to find it. The Larger Catechism, question 191 says, For what do we pray in the second request? Well, we're going to pray together. We're going to pray, Thy kingdom come, after each one of these blocks of prayer, because you can turn these into prayer. This is in the Catechism. We acknowledge that we and all humans are by nature under the dominion of sin and Satan. Say the words, Thy kingdom come. We pray then that the kingdom of sin and Satan be destroyed. that the gospel be preached throughout the whole world, that the Jews be converted, 
and that the full number of the Gentiles come in. We pray that the world will be supplied with evangelical officers and regulations. That means the law of Christ, the rule of Christ, the golden rule. Yes. We pray that it would be purged from corruption and recognized and supported by the civil authorities. We pray for the regulations of Christ to be administered fully and that these regulations may effectively convert sinners while confirming, conf comforting, and building up those who are already con converted. And we pray that Christ would rule over our hearts in the here and now. That he would hurry up and come again when we shall reign with him forever. And that he would be pleased to rule over everything that goes on in the world as may best bring about all these results. Now there's only 29 scriptures tied in the Old and New Testament tied to these phrases. You are supposed to say, oh, 29. This is the first week of Lent. So I challenge us to turn off our TVs for just one hour and carve out a slice of time one evening this week and just read one or more of these biblical passages corresponding to the lines of prayer found here in the catechism. Just see what a difference it may make in our moods and mental states and well-being. Now, are you ready for the finale of this rather long discourse? Question 192. For what do we pray in the third request? And the third request is, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I had some problems with this section upstairs. So I'm just going to shorten it to thy will be done. Jesus did that. You know, sometimes he would mention a scripture. And with, Jew, with the Jews at that time, it would recall the whole section. So when you say thy will be done, just think of thy will be done on earth as, as it is in heaven. So here we go. We acknowledge that we and all humans are by nature not only completely incapable and unwilling to know and do the will of God, thy will be done, but are actively prone to rebel against his word, to be unhappy with and complain about his providence and are naturally inclined to follow our own selfish desires and the directions of Satan. We pray then that God would by his spirit remove from us and others all spiritual blindness, weakness, indisposition to spiritual activities, and perverseness of heart. And that he would, by his grace, make us willing to know, to do, and submit to his will in every circumstance. With the same kind of humility, will be done. Cheerfulness, faithfulness, steadfastness, zeal, sincerity and constancy that the angels have in heaven. There's only 39 scriptural passages of the Old and New Testament tied to these. But again, carve out some time. Sit with the word. See how it changes you. Maybe you'll have less arguments at home 
Maybe things will go better with the kids. Maybe things will go better at your job. I know. Do I have to? <laughs> Nobody's got a gun to your head, but I really invite you to join me in doing this. The prayer that I prayed in the beginning, this time I'd like to, us to do it in unison together. God gave me this prayer, and I think it's worth praying together. Let's pray together. O oh, Abba, Father God, we pray with tender hearts and common grace that you would give our softened hearts a hunger and a longing for your kingdom to really come. Not just to us individually, but let your kingdom come to our communities, our nation, and our world. We pray you would make us willing to do your will and surrender our wills to your own with the cheerfulness and the zeal that the angels have, as in heaven, so here on earth. Amen.